Uh, my name is uh, Edgar Benson, and I'm a research associate uh, with the uh, Department of Horticulture at Auburn University. And uh, uh, I, along with Dr. Joe Kimball, conduct the uh, vegetable variety trials throughout the state. And uh, we've got uh, trials in three different locations in the north and central Alabama and in south Alabama. And uh, presently, we've got, we just uh, put in a trial or a couple of trials in uh, Bruton, uh, a bell pepper and tomato trial, uh, as well as uh, some uh, bell pepper and watermelon trial in uh, central Alabama. And, uh, and today I'll be talking about uh, tomato, uh, the program says tomato production, uh, but uh, I'll be talking about an aspect of, of uh, tomato and watermelon production, and that is variety selection. Uh, we put out a publication twice a year. It's in the spring and the fall. And uh, let's see, the spring, the fall comes out probably around, no, spring comes out around uh, November of each year. And the uh, fall comes out in May, around May of the following year. So um, I'll be talking to you about that. Okay. Uh, first off, tomatoes. Uh, this trial that I'm showing you today is was actually conducted in, in Cullman, and we've got one scheduled there this year, but as you know, the uh, devastation from the tomatoes, uh, not tomatoes, from the tornadoes um, may not allow us to conduct that or any other trial there this year, uh, depending on uh, when they get the facilities up and running. Uh, just to give you a little idea of what we, uh, how we conducted our trial, we uh, uh, fertilized according to Auburn University's uh, recommendations, which required 400 pounds of 5, 10, 15, um, of, uh, 10 pounds of nitrogen per acre per week, uh, applied pesticides weekly. And we used six-week-old transplants, tomato transplants. We planted them about a foot and a half apart on May 1st of last year. Uh, we had a, a within row, a between row spacing of six feet. We harvested four times between July 14th and August 2nd. And we graded these as extra large, large, and medium. And just to take a look at some of the varieties that we, we had, uh, Amelia and Bellarosa. Any of these look familiar to you? Any tomato growers? Well, Amelia and, uh, is a real popular variety, and Bellarosa is uh, up and coming. It's uh, on the station, it's gotten real popular. And one thing, some other things to point out here uh, we've got varieties. Usually, when you see varieties that have uh, 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 letters followed by a series of numbers like this. We, we're usually talking about some experimental varieties. Well, not technically, we can't call them varieties. They're experimental lines. And uh, what seed companies donate the seeds to us to trial. And they like to include varieties or, or experimental lines because depending on how well they do, they take those, those experimental lines. And if they do well, they will change this and give it a name just like one of these and they'll market those and then they'll, they'll sell them. And we like to have them because it gives us a sort of a jump um, on, the, on how well those uh, varieties will do if they are, if indeed they are named. One thing to point out here, uh, BHN 640. Now I know I said a series of letters and numbers, but this is the actual name of this variety as, as well as the uh, BHN 602. Uh, one thing to point out is uh, it's we get uh, thousands, of, literally thousands of uh, tomato varieties each year, and there there are lots of varieties on the market, and we like to try several different new ones each year. But in order for it to make sense, what we like to do is include uh, a variety that is more well known to people. And BHN 640 is a variety that's well known. It's a tomato variety that uh, was one of the first varieties to have resistance to tomato spotted wilt. And if you're a tomato grower, then you absolutely know what that is because it can, that disease can devastate a tomato crop. So they've uh, developed tomatoes that have uh, resistance to tomato spotted wilt. And uh, we use the BHN again as our uh, market standard in this case to compare all of the other varieties to. 
Okay. All right, well, um, let's see. One thing to point out here, uh, we got tribute in this case was number one. At, uh, we looked at 20 pound boxes per acre and tribute came in at number one at 3,000, a little over 3,000, uh, as well as Amelia and, and one of our experimental lines here, a um, little over 3,000. But it's not as cut, as dry, as cut and dry as that. Um, there, and now I'll talk a little bit about this number here down at the bottom, and that is LSD. And uh, that's not a variety, it's not a, not a drug, but it is, that LSD stands for least significant difference. And just to, uh, what, it, what that says is if you, it's, it's, it helps, it's actually like a measuring stick. And what that says is that if you take any two varieties here and you take, a, you take the difference of them and you get a difference that's less than 717 um, uh, 20-pound boxes per acre in this case, then there's really no real difference in those numbers. Even though you have, um, even though Tribute is, has a higher number than Amelia and so on and so forth. But, so this number acts as sort of a measuring stick, helps us, helps us to actually make sense of these numbers that we have here. And if you take, if you compare any two numbers again, if you take any two numbers, any two yields here, and you compare them, and you get a difference of greater than 717, then that is a real, that is a significant difference. And if, in this case here, if you take a difference between any two numbers, then there's no, there's no, uh, no differences that are greater than 717. So although we have a, Different numbers here. They're really no. They're really. They're really not significantly different. All right. Uh, this uh, the other slide gave us an idea of the yield. This lets us know the uh, actually the actual breakdown in that yield. And we have the varieties broken down into percent extra large, as well as uh, percent large. So. Bellarosa had 5% extra large fruit with 58% large fruit. So, and down here, our market standard uh, had 2% uh, uh, extra large and 43% uh, large fruit. And back on the other slide, uh, one thing I want to point out is uh, BHN was uh, all the other newer varieties. To wrap this up, all of the newer varieties performed just as well as the market standard there. So that's, that shows you how um, the value that having a market standard in the trial um, really is. And this is just uh, some pictures of our of some of the more popular varieties. Uh, BHN 640 here. It's uh, 75 days to harvest. And we've actually looked at this variety 12 different times in our trials over the years. And and in those times, it's had an average of uh, 23, over 2,300 boxes per acre, 2,320 pound boxes per acre. Amelia, uh, it's another uh, variety that's tomato spot at wilt resistance, wheat resistant, and we've also measured that one, or evaluated that one 12 times, and uh, it is a 80-day uh, tomato, and it had an average of just over 3,000 boxes per acre. Well, as Krista, we looked at that six times, and Bellarosa, um, it's a newer variety, we've already looked at that five times. And yeah, just uh, some newer varieties that are out there on the market that we've included this year in the trials this year. Uh, they're in the ground. Uh, Tribeca, Red Defender, Sunkeeper, Trinity, Rocky Top, Primo Red, and Security 23. All right, that brings us to the uh, watermelon section. And with the watermelon section, I'll be talking about both uh, triploid. The question is, if, if you go to the supermarket, do you see, in the tomato section, do you see the 
varieties that, uh, you see names of the varieties in the supermarket. And uh, uh, I'd have to say, unfortunately, no, uh, that's uh, a benefit, that's more of a benefit for the, the, the grower, the farmer, the quality. I mean, ultimately, the customer. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's, it's not something that um, the customer knows. All right. Any other questions? Tomatoes. All right. All right. Uh, with uh, I got tomato variety trials. Stay watermelon. Anyway, this is that's watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> nice big tomatoes. Uh, in this trial, uh, well, in this presentation today, I'll be talking about uh, not just uh, seeded watermelons, but seedless watermelons as well. And uh, I include this picture because it's a, it's a newer type of uh, watermelon that you're seeing more and more in grocery stores. This is, uh, I won't be talking about these, but I just, I wanted to include the picture. These are called uh, actually mini watermelons or mini melons or palm melons or personal size melons, they've got several different names. Um, but I just wanted to put that picture there. All right, uh, this is the world ranking of uh, watermelons. I just wanted to include this here, just as a bit of trivia. Uh, any idea who's the number, the number one country in producing watermelons? China. Exactly right. China's number one, uh, followed by Iran, Turkey, Brazil, the United States, and Mexico. Is, uh, is the last. And nationwide, Alabama comes in at number 14 in production. Is there a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Alabama comes in at number 14 in, uh, in, uh, nation, in, the, in the nation in producing watermelons, followed by Florida. Oh, well, Florida's number one. California is number two. Texas, number three. Georgia, number four. It's going to take it all the way to number 10. Arizona, number five, which surprised me. Uh, uh, India, uh, Indiana, number six. South Carolina, number seven. North Carolina, number eight. And Delaware, uh, number nine. And Maryland, number 10. Uh, those kind of surprised me as well. But just a bit of trivia, just wanted to include that in there. I thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, again, uh, here's our list of varieties that we, uh, of seedless varieties that we used in our trials last year. Uh, QV776 again is a uh, experimental variety and this one looks like it could be an experimental but actually it's not. It's a uh, it's one of the first, well I won't say the first, but it was a it's an older seedless type of watermelon and uh, Triax 313 and we were using this one as our market standard so that we can compare these newer varieties to it. Again, this give you an idea of what um, we did to our soils. Uh, fertilized according to the uh, Auburn University Laboratory uh, Soils Lab uh, recommendations, um, which called for triple 13 at a rate of 460 pounds per acre. Uh, we gave uh, weekly injections after that at, uh, of calcium nitrate at a rate of 40 uh, pounds per acre. And uh, I just like the personal melons there. That's the truck bed full of them there. And before I talk about the yield, uh, a little bit about quality. Uh, to the, the center here is the bricks reading for sweetness. And, uh, and this is in percentage. Actually, bricks is, is it's a measure of soluble solids, which is the total solids in the, in the watermelon. Uh, but that is a, a, a and I, it gives us an idea of how sweet a watermelon is. And uh, when you have a reading of 10% or greater, then that's considered sweet. And what, typically what we do is uh, a grower will, uh, that's why I have this thing here, uh, a refractometer. Who's seen one of these? If you bear with me for a minute. A, uh, a grower or you know anyone working with watermelons, they will take uh, this little instrument here. Looks like a sort of a telescope, and uh, what they'll do is they'll 
take open this flap here. And I'll put a drop of the fluid from the watermelon and I'll close the flap and using natural light to hold it up to the sunlight or whatever and they'll peer through here and it will tell you, it'll give you a reading of the percentage of uh, soluble solids which is a, sort of an indirect measure of sugar. And there again, here again, 10% uh, or higher is considered sweet. Uh, and another quality attribute is uh, rind thickness. Now this just sort of plays to uh, uh, shipping. And the thicker the rind, the better for shipping. And we've got anywhere from an inch to three quarters of an inch. All right, and this is our yield. Uh, looking at our LSD, uh, 16,307. Uh, no no uh, two var uh, varieties when you compare them have a difference greater than this, so uh, they're, these are really not statistically different, even though you have one higher, one number higher than the other, so on and so forth. And uh, this is our market standard again, it shows you how well that, that performed. And uh, it's at the very bottom, and, this, and what this says is, is that these newer varieties performed just as well as the old market standard. All right, and this, now we're to the seeded types of watermelon. And in this case, we use Stargazer. It's an 85-day watermelon. It's uh, an elongated type. And uh, just getting right to the, uh, the yield here, uh, this is the only case that I've found so far that uh, we've, we've had a yield difference. If you compare Legacy, here we go. If you compare Legacy to any of these others, there's no difference greater than 19,000 here. But if you compare Legacy to Stargazer, our market standard, it's, it's really high, it's significantly higher than our market standard. As a matter of fact, all of these new varieties are higher than the market standard. So all of them did better than the market standard. Okay, again, in, in our BRICS reading, um, all of them are higher than, or, or, or at least 10%, so they're all considered sweet. Uh, Royal Sweet being the sweetest there. All right, this is some pictures. Uh, there's Liberty, uh, sort of has the kind of a all sweet type, even though it is it's round. It, it is seedless. Our market standard Triax 313, and one of the experimentals there, again seedless. Sort of have they have more of a crimson sweet uh, rind pattern there. Majestic, Lamar. Um, I don't think I really talked about that one. It was a, one of the smaller melons, and again, uh, these are all seed, seedless. And orange sunshine, which is uh, as the name indicates, is orange flesh. Is orange flesh, and I don't know if you can really see here it. Uh, Looks as though it's trying to make seeds, but it's, uh, it's really not. Those are just the cavities where the seeds would have gone. All right, and that's the end of those uh, two presentations. And uh, let me get down, well, let's see. I'll go through the